All right. Welcome everybody to our talk on Kubernetes and Crossplane and building a platform API on top of Kubernetes. So there are still some uh, free seats available here in the front on the right side and a couple there uh, on the left if you don't want to stand in the back. And well, today uh, we want to talk about our experience in uh, adopting Kubernetes controllers for managing things who are not core Kubernetes controllers. And we are doing that with a CNCF project called Crossplane. And they have quite the presence here. So I want to have a quick show of hands who has heard of Crossplane before. All right, all right. It's uh, hard, to not, uh, hard to ignore Crossplane at this conference, that's for sure. And that's good. So uh, we'll start with a quick intro, uh, who, who we are. Uh, my colleague Hannes, maybe you want to go first? Yeah, uh, my name is Hannes Blut. I, um, I'm a cloud architect at, at Accenture and uh, I live in Frankfurt, Germany. My name is Jan Vegas. I uh, live in Berlin. I'm a platform architect at Accenture. I do, uh, uh, I do most of the stuff I do is open source. Uh, I'm a contributor to the Crossplane project. I do also do the um, Berlin CI CD meetup. So if you're in Berlin and if you are interested in, um, in, in connecting and uh, with other folks who are running CI CD, then uh, feel free to reach out. It's been on hiatus for the past two years due to some pandemic events, but we plan to pick it up this summer again. And we are also managing the FOSTEM CI CD dev room. So if you are uh, joining FOSTEM in Brussels, hopefully in presence next year, um, feel free to catch us in the CICD dev room. All right, <clears throat> so a very quick introduction to Crossplane. So probably you've by now heard many intros to Crossplane. Uh, this, is, uh, this might be the third one, but let me quickly explain in layman's terms. So what Crossplane does, it extends uh, a service provider APIs, which are pictured here at the bottom, into the Kubernetes resource model, into the Kubernetes database. So A, as a user, I can uh, kubectl get clusters, and I do get my EKS cluster back from AWS. Similar, I can um, create Kubernetes clusters via, um, via the Kubernetes platform. So I just apply a familiar YAML, and uh, there's a controller running who takes this YAML representation and talks to the AWS API via AWS Go SDK and manage the state at AWS for me. It continuously does so, so that's the Kubernetes pattern, the reconciliation. Uh, every, well, it's configurable, but every 60 seconds per default. So if there's any, any drift or any changes, then those are overwritten or updated to the state which I want to uh, give that. So this is a Kubernetes example. I can provision Kubernetes via Kubernetes, but obviously I can uh, create any object at any external API provider. So it could be an S3 bucket, uh, a, a cloud storage object, an, an AKS a cluster, a Lambda uh, stuff. So anything really which, which is mirrored into the Kubernetes ecosystem. OK, let's take a closer look at the Kubernetes example. I love to take the Kubernetes example because it's, uh, it's a very complex one. Um, usually an, S, an S3 bucket or a cloud, com, uh, cloud storage bucket is just a, simil, a, a very simple object, and you just apply it, so there's no like, magic behind that. But to provision a Kubernetes cluster at uh, cloud providers or e or on-prem is usually a very complex thing to do. Uh, and so pictured here at the bottom are, uh, it's an example stack of a, a, a fictional company which you, you might run. Uh, there are two cloud providers, AWS and uh, Azure. There's a code repository, GitLab. Uh, there's a Grafana for dashboarding. There's obviously probably your organization runs Kubernetes. So there's a Kubernetes API, Vault for secret store, uh, Styra for policies, Argo CD for GitOps, and so on and so forth. So all those are mirrored into the Kubernetes ecosystem. So you have them available as like one-to-one -one representations. However, that's usually not what you want to kind of 
push this complexity to the to every user of your of your platform. Um, what you most of the time want to do is at least apply some compliance and security. So, for example, a famous example is the visibility of an API. In in the Kubernetes case, that would be like every Kubernetes cluster should be a private Kubernetes cluster and not a public one. That should be a default. Um, with an S3 bucket, it's the same. It should be private by default, for example, and should be encrypted via KMS. So those are um, defaults you can set. And you also want to make it simple. And in the case for Kubernetes cluster, there are many, many different API calls you need to take to add AWS to create a cluster, then at your internal uh, SaaS services to register the cluster once it's ready, and to install operators and controllers to make your cluster compliant and integrate in the rest of your enterprise. And that's uh, something which happens here uh, in the integration part and in the custom platform part. Uh, at the top, you see the simple object which your users of the platform are using when they want to have a Kubernetes cluster and provision a Kubernetes cluster. So it's a very simple one. But under the hood, it goes to AWS and it creates an IAM role, IAM policy, security group, uh, OADC provider, uh, actual EKS cluster, um, all those EKS cluster add-ons um, which are available. Um, and it goes, to, it goes then to Kubernetes because once the EKS cluster is ready, it's not like not ready to hand out. It still needs to run like compliance and integration software, which you need to deploy. And that's happening via the Kubernetes API then in the same kind of uh, call. So um, there then is deployed the compliance software for CM or uh, security scanning or so. Um, and all those controllers for integrating, which are not available via EKS add-ons. And then this, the, the Kubernetes cluster is registered at um, well, in this case, at uh, Styra, which is a control plane for policies for OPA, and it's registered at Argo CD so that users can use GitOps to deploy their uh, application into the cluster. So they get uh, everything out of the box. Uh, but still, that's hidden uh, from the user by the platform team by this integration. So in the end, uh, cross plane. To achieve this, uh, it's a cross is a kind of a low-code platform, so you cannot like edit the stuff via UI yet, but you you can offer an API without writing actual code, so you can describe it in YAML, and uh, it allows you to provide uh, kind of abstractions and governance and, and and security to it. All right, that sounds really f fun and games. Um, but what are the top nine challenges uh, we encountered when running this approach at scale and in production? So at scale means we are running, it's obviously it's not Google scale, uh, we are running um, a, a couple of thousand managed resources. So that's, uh, I guess it's not like um, super less, it's also not like Google scale, but maybe it's something in between. And we want to go over some challenges we faced when when implementing that. We've been starting with Crossplane two years ago, and this helped us to like, get a very, very good understanding of the product. We adopted it pre-version 1.0, and were able to uh, kind of shape a bit the product to our needs. And uh, some of the stuff you see in today's Crossplane is uh, based on our feedback. So the first thing is uh, the Crossplane deployment model. So Crossplane is a Kubernetes extension, and by that it's, it's installable in a Kubernetes cluster. So you might go uh, that just simply every application cluster gets a Crossplane installation. So the application is the, the blue boxes uh, on, on the right, and the uh, Crossplane installation is the, the colorful representation. So what that gets you from an application uh, point of view, it's a very good integration between infrastructure and application because now you can take the, um, you can read from an application, you can directly read the connection details of the database or the, um, the uh, S3 bucket or so from the same cluster in, in, from a secret, for example. 
Uh, and also, you have a very good hard isolation between tenants because, well, Kubernetes uh, tenancy model is the best when there are different Kubernetes clusters. However, how do you bootstrap those clusters? So in the end, um, you can offer a very, uh, the, the, the broad range of the cloud provider or SaaS provider offerings into the cluster. However, a Kubernetes cluster is just one of these offerings. And with this approach, where you are kind of, it's expected you're already running a Kubernetes cluster. So how do you get to those clusters? So the next thing in the middle is, well, you have a central API for infrastructure provisioning so that users go to the central API, provision their cloud resources or kind of SaaS resources, and then they are using those SaaS resources directly. Uh, so they go to a central cross plane instance and create a bucket, uh, an EKS clusters, and so on, and then they connect to those directly and, and use that. So that's great, bootstrapping problem solved. Um, I, have a, I have a control plane for all my infrastructure. However, now you have kind of a bit of the soft isolation problem between, uh, between tenants. Although you're not running any workloads in the central cluster, uh, that's, that's offered by like a, a, a central platform team, um, there are no workloads, so it's not like, like uh, resource starvation or so, which you might run into, which is a common problem if, if, if you're running a multi-tenant uh, Kubernetes cluster. However, uh, you are still running a single controller for the entire, um, for, for all the tenants. And you could still get into some issues when, for example, one tenant creates a huge load of API resources, and then you get rate limited or something. because. CRDs are cluster-wide in Kubernetes, as you all probably know. And cluster-wide means there's only a single controller reconciling those objects. So there's no, well, at least not in crossplay, no, no way to shard uh, co controllers to uh, CRDs. And that's kind of the issue with this model. There are some scalability uh, challenges. So. Third, on the bottom is, well, obvious solution, you run a cross-plane instance per tenant. So everybody gets a cross-plane instance. However, it's a kind of a tricky thing because you don't want to run the cross-plane instance in an actual Kubernetes cluster because it doesn't run any workloads. It, and it would be very kind of, from a resource point of view, very cost-intensive to run a dedicated Kubernetes cluster just for the control plane, for every tenant. That depends on how many tenants you have, obviously. Um, so th those can be virtualized. And there are some uh, ways to virtualize them via um, open source tools. So uh, a lot of folks use vCluster by loft.sh for running virtual uh, Kubernetes cluster. Or there's the cluster API provider nested from uh, from the uh, special interest group uh, from Kubernetes, who, who does also that, and uh, probably a thousand other ways. You could also use uh, 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 an offering from Upbound to achieve that. And then you can run the controller either inside the virtual cluster, or you can run it outside and connect to the virtual cluster. But uh, you get the hard isolation that's solved. Uh, you get a separation between control plane and data plane. However, it's a bit more complex setup, and probably your adoption goes uh, a bit along these lines. All right, the approach to compositions. That's something we, uh, we faced. So compositions are the feature how to abstract um, resources. So when you build your automation, you, maybe you are in an, in an application team and you want to start with the application. So build from top down, application on top, cloud resources at the bottom, and you want to deploy the application, and it should come with uh, like a stack. It, it comes, it's a vertical integrated stack. Application uses database, object store, queue, uh, maybe Kubernetes, maybe not, maybe uh, cloud functions or so. Um, but that's something you want to um, uh, aggregate. So basically you abstract the application. That's very useful if you're starting with cross-plane from like either an application team or a small company. 
But however, if you're starting in a large organization, that's very cumbersome and very challenging to implement because now you're the one with the SME for Crossplane and have the experience with, with running that. You need to go to every application team in the enterprise and build the, those abstractions for them and that's uh, simply not gonna scale. So you start from the bottom. You are the service provider and you want to offer those resources to your users. So from like the uh, Azure example, you have from the AKS, you build a, a, a compliant AKS object, a compliant AKS API, a compliant blob store, uh, a compliant um, Cosmos DB, and a compliant load balancer. Those are just uh, examples here. So those applications team, they can just like pick and choose what they, from a service catalog kind of, of thing. And then, like from a maturity point or adoption point, the third example here would be the one um, where the adoption is, is quite far already. A platform team would create those um, stuff from the bottom, so those compliant API objects, and then application teams who are already familiar or kind of uh, uh, borrowing resources uh, from, from the central team, they would write their automati automation based on top of those compliant objects already. Well, <clears throat> speaking of all those uh, compositions, this might be uh, not a surprise uh, for uh, many of you, but uh, Kubernetes is uh, a favorite, uh, well, someone said that at a conference, Kubernetes is my favorite YAML database, so expect that you need to manage more, even more YAML. So probably you're already managing a lot of YAML. Um, for sure, if you're running stuff like the um, Cube Prometheus stack or something, um, but it will now get even more. It's like Crossplay is a low-code platform. You don't need to write Go code to, for just, well, use, to use it. However, you need to still describe those APIs and those compositions, and that's done in Open API in YAML. So there could be a lot of bugs, as, as you all probably know, with in, indentation and, and, and white spaces and types and so on, depending on the approach how you manage YAML. So if it's just like basic templating, hand templating, or, or, or writing that manually, that's maybe something which will, uh, which will change when you, when you adopt that. So uh, definitely some, some stuff I'm very excited about is uh, Qlang for when you can do validation and like have a type safety and all this kind of stuff. However, it also kind of uh, is a bit of since it has a very good Go integration, it's, it's very kind of, uh, it defeats a bit the low code pattern because now you kind of still go into a bit of, of writing code. However, that's, uh, you, you get a lot more safety this way. User expectations. Um, when you apply a, a pod spec, you get a container almost immediately, so at least you should. Um, but infrastructure is slow. So if you apply, for example, an RDS database, it will take easily five minutes or more. And uh, there are some very familiar or uh, famous examples which take 10, 50 minutes for infrastructure to get ready. Um, and that's something which uh, some users might not expect to see from the Kubernetes API, because usually from what they know, the Kubernetes API, it's like quick and, and you get a like immediate reaction. So some might just like delete and recreate those objects in a very fast way and that's it. Infrastructure usually doesn't like that. And then obviously, <clears throat> depending on the approach, your users might not know Kubernetes. So there are some users in your org who, who don't use Kubernetes. They are running Google Cloud Functions or Lambdas or uh, App Runner or Cloud Run or, or some like data batch products, AWS batch or something. Um, but now they need to kind of describe their stuff in Kubernetes YAML. So while they not might run workloads in Kubernetes, they still need to kind of know the API. So you can get around that by, uh, well, offering uh, a UI so that they can more or less uh, create those resources via workflow or via UI, but still in the end, um, they need to know some API to create those stuffs. 
Okay, I'm looking a bit at the time, <coughs> so I, I'll skip the stuff. <coughs> Another thing, now that you're using Kubernetes for not only applications, but also for your platform and the infrastructure, you can leverage the wealth of the Kubernetes ecosystem. And that might be, a, well, at least it sure is my first example of showing the uh, CNCF landscape in a, in a good way, because uh, many, many of those things are, or probably all of those things, are integrated with Kubernetes. So two, I, I brought two examples here. So for example, since now you have this central layer where you apply all your stuff, you have also a central way for managing policies at this layer. You don't, well, still you should uh, use, uh, uh, for example, those IAM stuff on AWS and on, on, on Google Cloud and uh, roles and responsibilities uh, at, at, at GitLab and, um, and, and Argo CD and all those uh, SaaS offerings you, you might use. However, you can, do, you can shift a bit more to the left and apply those things in a common language at the same layer. So you, you write the same policies kind of for, for, uh, for the source code repository, for the GitOps software, for, uh, for Grafana, for, uh, for Kubernetes, um, for the application. So, well, on a, on a very low layer, that means the RBAC stuff from core Kubernetes, but you can also, and probably you should run some more fine-grained policy execution stuff like OPA, like Kiberno, or any of those things. And what you can do with those is then to have like quotas, for example, for, um, for your infrastructure. So depending on most, sometimes the, uh, the billing processes in, in large orgs are not very uh, cloud native, maybe. So there might be some subscription models. So s someone says, OK, I have, I have uh, like an SML subscription. And S is, I don't know, two Kubernetes clusters and, and 10 nodes. And this you can easily implement in, uh, in, at this layer. So that's, it, it's really easy. And other examples are, for example, running kubegenitor to just re, like, remove demo uh, environments after, after a day or two. Um, that's pretty easy. Or kube cost to manage costs. So, this gets very easy, and that, uh, that was just uh, small examples. Uh, I'll now hand over to Hannes, uh, feel free. <clears throat> All right. Um, so the next point, or the, the next topic where we had to deal with some issues were, was a CRD maturity. Um, so CRDs are very nice to extend Kubernetes, but um, they, they were built to, um, to be part of the container orchestration at first. And then they evolved to be more than that, where people started building operators rather than controllers that were just inside Kubernetes. Um, and with, with that, now, uh, as Jan said, there, there are providers that um, implement all the resources for their specific cloud provider. And with AWS, that's over 700 APIs. And with uh, Azure, that's over 600 APIs. And then you end up with multiple thousand CRDs in your cluster. Um, and just that just doesn't scale very well. Um, so one of the issues that we had was the Kubernetes um, behavior around immutability. In, in the open AP scheme, you can specify that a field is immutable, but it's not observed in Kubernetes. So sometimes your, pro, uh, your cloud provider also has um, some sort of API points that can't be changed. Uh, I don't actually have an example, but I, I remember they, um, that you, you couldn't change uh, like a, the type of node that you're running on or something like that. But, um, and then I could say in my CRD description, please don't change this or don't allow it to change, but you can. And then the user is confused about why, why it's not updating in uh, AWS because that's what he would expect from the API. Um, the next thing that we have is when we're working with APIs, uh, we have some sort of, like, if it evolves, you want to version it because uh, you might have breaking changes. And CRDs allow you to write conversion webhooks, but um, 
until recently that wasn't available in Crossplane. I'm, uh, I'm, it's being worked on, but it's not there yet. Um, and then on the other hand, even if you have conversion web hooks, it's still more reliable to, uh, to do the, the migration manually and to help your users uh, um, do their migration over time, as in the deprecated, deprecation version that Kubernetes is using itself. Um, all right, I will also skip the rest here because of the time. Um, concerning the scalability, there was a talk yesterday. Um, it was yesterday afternoon, the CRD that broke the camel's back. Um, I'm sure you'll find some information there. Um, since we're using YAML uh, and our Kubernetes API, you can, we can now deploy everything uh, to, through GitOps instead of CIOps. We don't use a pipeline that ex executes a Terraform script anymore. It's, you can actually use the same tool, like Argo CD, for example, uh, to synchronize everything that we have in our repository to our cluster. Um, and that allows us to use the same mechanisms for our applications and infrastructure. Um, but again, this, this goes back to what is your user expectation. And if you say, okay, you can use the same, same behavior or the same API for both, um, they might expect you to have those offered in the same cluster. And then with what we discussed earlier about the, how do we deploy or architecture our different cross-plane um, control planes, it's just um, that they might expect to be able to deploy both into the same cluster, for example, with a Helm chart, uh, but that might not work. Um, and so there's some interesting development around multi-cluster architectures and or management and cluster federations. And that is something where we need to figure out how can we make it manageable across multiple clusters as well. Um, and then there's, a, of course, the question, what's the end? Like, where do, we, uh, where do we stop using GitOps? Do we deploy our secrets with GitOps? We can use SOPs, for example, to to encrypt everything in our repositories and then let it deploy. But it might be more reasonable to use a secret provider like Vault or the Secrets Manager or something similar um, to just uh, request the secret and then use that as credential instead. Um, and of course, using, using GitOps with your node group with like a scaling configuration that just uh, creates more conflicts where your, your provider is, or your Argo CD is trying to, to sync your repository. And then on the other hand, you have the autoscaler telling the cluster, please scale down and, and cross-plane in between syncing the options back. So you have a, a couple of conflicting controllers as well. Um, and that, then there's, there are options around that. You can set fields to be ignored in some, uh, in some sense. But that is an issue that needs to be solved uh, whenever the, it occurs. Um, and then I think what we also learned, uh, since we're offering a platform to our users, uh, it needs to be documented. And that's, that's not enough to just um, to write a, a short entry and, oh, please use crossplane. Uh, pull your CRDs from the server because get CRDs is already an operation that a normal user can't do because it's cluster scoped. Um, so we need API documentation similar to the doc CRDs dev uh, that really well reflects all the APIs in, um, for Crossplane, for example. Um, then there is uh, usage documentation on what are the behaviors of what the user is deploying, what are the side effects, how do they interact. And of course, um, whenever something changes or is deprecated, we need release notes, we need some sort of lifecycle management and uh, API and operator lifecycle management. There was another talk on Wednesday on this. I think on Wednesday. Um, and then the last thing is uh, contributions. Since we are working in an enterprise situation, it's uh, important to be sure that 
you know, we can use open source, we can contribute to open source. And in our case, uh, we were lucky, we were able to engage with Crossplane very early on um, to shape their, their product as well, so we can, um, can make sure that it fulfills the needs that we have at that point or um, that, that you need f for building a platform. Um, we have also been uh, contributors to the provider I AWS in, in a lot of resources. And uh, we have open sourced a couple of other providers like the provider GitLab, provider Argo CD, and provider Styra. And then with a provider Grafana, we have built it uh, using the JET implementation or like the TerraJet implementation. Um, and that was then taken over by the Grafana community and they are now maintaining their own provider as well, which is something that uh, might be nice for all the other cloud providers to do as well. Um, thank you for listening and uh, if you want to to reach out to us, feel free to do so. And if there are any questions, I think.